Hey guys, we're going to get started, so if you're still getting through, that's great. Just try to do it quietly. Um, my name is Jessica Jones. I am Associate Director at the National Security Institute. We are really excited to have you guys here. Happy to co-host with um, Federalist Society for today's debate on whether the president has executive authority to, uh, the legal authority to fund a wall, border wall um, by declaring a national emergency. Um, as a little background, NSI was founded about two years ago to find real-world answers to challenging a national security law and policy questions. Just some things that are coming up on our calendar that are here at the school. Next week, we are helping kick off DHS, DHS's newest agency, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. We're going to have Director Chris Krebs and Assistant uh, Director Jeanette Mumphrey here, and we're going to have a reception to follow. That's on March 11th. The week after that, on March 20th, we're going to have uh, General Counsel for Treasury, Brett McIntosh, here to talk about Treasury's role in advancing national security. And then one more thing, at the end of the month, on March 27th, we're hosting an intelligence career panel with folks from the intelligence community, DOJ, DOD. Um, should be really interesting. So hopefully we can see you guys there. With that, I will kick it off to Sarah to help get this event going. Hey guys, thank you so much again for being here. I'm sure pretty much all of you know me by now, but I'm Sarah and I'm president of the Federalist Society. Uh, we want to give a huge shout out to our co-sponsor, NSI, for helping us put on this event. Um, so just a general announcement before we have this event, I would like to say that um, all the speakers here are will be discussing the legal authority that the executive has, um, and this does not necessarily reflect political or policy opinions um, on whether or not the current president um, should do this, um, but rather the legal authority to do it. Um, so first and foremost, I'm going to be introducing our moderator, Adam Perlman. Um, Adam is a former associate deputy counsel of the United States Department of Defense. Um, soon he'll be starting at the State Department, where, where he will be the senior advisor of legal policy in the State Department's Counterterrorism Bureau. Um, and he previously held several positions in, in the DOJ, and he clerked for the Honorable Royce Lambert in the District Court of the District of Columbia. Um, Mr. Shapiro will be one of our debaters, and he's on my far right, um, and he's the director of the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute. Um, before joining Cato, he was a special assistant advisor to the multinational force in Iraq on the rule of law issues and, and practice at Patton Boggs and Cleary Gottlieb. Mr. Shapiro clerked for Judge Grady Jolly of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit after graduating law school and has testified before Congress and state legislatures and has filed more than 300 amicus briefs in the Supreme Court. And then last but not least, um, to my closest here is Professor Krauss, who has been teaching at George Mason for over 30 years. Um, Professor Klaus Krauss clerked for a justice on Canada's Supreme Court before attending Yale Law School. And he is a nationally recognized scholar on torts and ethics issues. And as many of you know, at George Mason, he teaches torts, jurisprudence, and products liability, and has a new edition of his products liability book um, <laughs> that has just been published. Um, Professor Krauss will finish his distinguished teaching career at George Mason in the spring of 2020. And although it's a great loss for the students here, I know many of us are looking forward to taking a final class with him next spring. Um, so without further ado, let the debate begin. And, and notice that you have you have to brought, bring in two Canadians to debate this. <laughs> like most immigrants, we do a job that most native-born Americans do. <laughs> and next week's event will be debating a border wall along Canada. <laughs> I'm reminded of the late, great Canadian-American actor John Candy's last movie, Canadian Bacon, right, where he plays this paranoid Buffalo sheriff uh, thinking about the invasion from the north, and there are these public service ads, right, Canadians, they walk among us. <laughs> and I'm likely reminded of uh, Louis Black's stand-up uh, routine, Black on Broadway, where he says, we need the border wall on Canada because that's where all the cold air comes from. <laughs> <laughs> I, gotta, I, gotta tell, I gotta tell you, Leah, that, that there's only one uh, native-born Canadian here. Well, <laughs> since I'm from Jackson Heights, New York. Well, I'm, I'm, I was born in Moscow, right? Okay, so there's no native. <laughs> Wait, so you've naturalized twice as well? Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 So. See, that's a rare thing. You yeah. naturalized. Anyway, I am also from a foreign country, California. <laughs> <laughs> what we really need, if we really want to keep out, you know, socialists and, and, and ne'er do wells who bring their their bad, uh, you know, uh, culture to our country, we built the wall on Arizona's. Western border, not the southern. <laughs> yes, that'll keep out all the terrible drivers in Arizona. Um, but anyway, we just continue to stare. <laughs> uh, 
yes, uh, extra credit in all your con law classes will come from this. So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you to FedSoc and, and NSI for hosting what is certain to be a fascinating and lively debate concerning the legality of funding a border wall in light of the President's proclamation of February 15th declaring a national emergency on our southern border. Now, Professor Extraordinaire Krauss will be taking the affirmative position, arguing that the President does have the legal authority to fund the wall by declaring a national emergency. And our scholar of all things, Mr. Shapiro, will argue that he does not. I happen to have the easiest job in this room. I take no position at all. Uh, and even though I've not worked for DOD for uh, a while now, uh, I should begin by reiterating Sarah's comments that nothing that I say here, uh, to the extent that I say anything of substance, would necessarily reflect any policy or position of the Department of Defense and the U.S. government. Now, there, of course, is a lot to unpack here. Any high school civics class will teach the basic principle that Article I of the Constitution grants Congress the power <coughs> of Congress. Here in the law school setting, we obviously get a bit more granular. Those of you who have taken a course in the First Amendment will be familiar with the time, place, and manner qualifiers that sometimes cabin free, free speech rights. Well, appropriations law has its own similarly sounding trio of considerations. Purpose, time, and amount. Under normal circumstances, then, fiscal lawyers in the federal government therefore have to ask, are we spending the right money on the right thing? Purpose. Are we spending the right money at the right time? And do we have enough money, enough, enough money, the amount, at the right time? The Congress passed the National Emergencies Act in 1976, and six years later enacted another provision, codified at 10 U.S.C. 2808, when we hear about Section 2808, and probably some other provisions, uh, that on their face appear to give the executive branch, through the Secretary of Defense, wide berth in moving around funds for military construction projects not otherwise authorized by law that are necessary to support the use of armed forces in relation to a declared emergency. Congress included a reporting provision and decreed that money reallocated <coughs> under the authority of Section 2808 could not exceed the amount of military construction funds that have been appropriated but not obligated. That is, not flagged, not become, uh, not generated a legal obligation to pay such as signing a contract or receiving a service. But Congress otherwise appears to have grant all but gutted the purpose test in uh, these specific circumstances. And so we ask our debaters today, as Sarah said, not whether all this is a good idea, but whether it's legal. So as a constitutional matter, does the president have inherent authority via Article II to declare a national emergency and use that declaration as a vehicle to take funds appropriated to different projects and repurpose them to build the wall? And if he does not, do the provisions such as the NEA, the National Emergencies Act, or Section 2808 allow him to do so? And even if those laws do allow him to on their face, are they constitutional? So with that, because Professor Krauss has the affirmative, he goes first. Convince us. Thanks. Thank you so much. It's great to be back. Uh, I got back uh, yesterday and will be headed uh, out uh, on an airplane later today. So as many of you know, I'm uh, spending this uh, semester uh, in South Carolina and I had gotten, quickly gotten unused to the cold weather here. So hopefully get a little warmer when I get back, uh, get back home. Um, just to add on to what Sarah uh, Smerling said, um, I just wanted to be clear. One thing should be really clear in a law school, right? Politics and law are two very different things. I've been very disappointed by some judicial opinions that have, uh, that have come down adverse to actions taken by President Trump, and those judicial decisions have been often overturned uh, subsequently. Uh, and I get the impression sometimes that if those same decisions had been made by, say, President Obama instead of President Trump, the initial judicial decision would have been different. Uh, and that dismays me no end as a defender of the rule of law. And I've got to specify that I did not vote for President Trump. I did not support uh, President Trump. This has nothing to do with my own politics, as uh, Sarah Smerling said. Uh, this has only to do with um, the law. So let me start by um, uh, uh, quoting from today's edition of the Wall Street Journal. 
page one, a, uh, below the fold, but page uh, A1 of the Wall Street Journal. 66,400 people were caught trying to illegally cross the southern border between ports of entry in February 2019 alone. This is March, now we're at the start of March. Last month, 66,400 were caught. Probably at least an equal number managed to get across without being caught. That's a, that's a rate of well over one million people per year. Um, this situation, uh, quoting from the journal, this situation is not sustainable, said Customs and Border Protection Commissioner Magdalena. Amnesty International reports that 80% of illegally crossing women experience rape and sexual assault during the migration process. Last month, there was the largest seizure of fentanyl at the southern border ever recorded by Customs and Border Protection. Approximately 650 pounds of meth and fentanyl were seized. To put 650 pounds in perspective, in 2017, Columbus, Ohio police seized 4.5 pounds, 4.5, not 650, 4.5 pounds of fentanyl, which was enough to kill every person in the city of Columbus, 800,000 people. That's 4.5 pounds. They seized 650 pounds at the border. How much more is successfully smuggled through border crossings? I don't know. Between border crossings, I don't know. But Purdue Pharmaceutical, uh, which makes fentanyl and has been sued, uh, claims to have records that indicate that they produce about 10% of the fentanyl consumed in this country and that the great majority of it is smuggled in uh, across the southern border. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's the claim. Over the last two years, illegal immigrants have been charged with nearly 100,000 assaults, 30,000 sex crimes, and 4,000 murders. Okay, does that mean that, Pref that the President Trump can legally spend funds to build the border wall? Well, we should really start with Justice Jackson's famous concurrence in the uh, uh, case uh, uh, called Youngstown Sheet and Tube versus Sawyer. Uh, Jackson divided presidential authority into three categories of legitimacy. First and most legitimate were cases in which the president acts pursuant both to an, either an express or implied authorization of the Constitution and to a congressional uh, power. Second is when there's a constitutional grant but implicit or explicit but no but silence on the part of Congress and third when the president takes measures incompatible with the expressed will of Congress his power is at the lowest ebb. So I actually think the first condition holds here so let me try to make that case again it's a legal case not a policy case uh, briefly. First quoting from the United States Supreme Court in 1950 in the case of Nell versus Shaughnessy and I quote the exclusion of aliens is a fundamental act of sovereignty. The right to do so stems not alone from legislative power, but is inherent in the executive power to control the foreign affairs of the nation. So that was just looking at the Constitution itself. But in addition, as Mr. Perlman has indicated, Congress has confirmed this inherent constitutional power. The 1976 National Emergencies Act, which I'm going to call NEA, uh, for short, makes it easy, relatively easy for a president to declare a national emergency. And at least two other subordinate statutes, one of which Mr. Perlman has named, uh, provide that if he does declare a national emergency under NEA, he should be able to build the wall. I say should be because there are issues of statutory construction that I do want to delve into a little bit. So first let me talk about the declaration of national emergency. If President Trump wants to know that the chaos at the southern border creates a state of disorder, I think he's pretty much free to do so. The NEA establishes no justiciable conditions for when this can be done. The Brennan Center for Justice at NYU Law School last year published a, a list of literally dozens of national emergencies that have been declared by each and every president since NEA was adopted. They weren't contested, unlike uh, uh, this declaration by President Trump. Most of those national emergencies are, in fact, still in effect. They were never, in, they were never terminated. Most of them concern harms to the United States that are much less obvious than the uh, harms at the southern border that I described at the beginning of my uh, remarks. For example, just to give you two examples, in 1991, President George H.W. Bush declared that the devastating hurricane in Haiti constituted a national emergency in the United States, which enabled him to do things that he otherwise couldn't do. 
1997, President Bill Clinton declared that the large-scale repression of the democratic opposition in Burma, today Myanmar, constituted a national emergency in the United States. Uh, uh, now, don't get me wrong, as I said at the beginning of my remarks, a federal judge who dislikes Donald Trump might intervene to say that there's no national emergency at our southern border. But in my opinion, that would be lawless judicial activism. Accepted practice, as described by the Brennan Center at NYU Law School, indicates that the president is due some deference by the courts, raising a political question into which courts shouldn't delve, especially given that Congress can defeat the declaration of emergency by the means described in the NEA itself. Okay, what can president, assuming that President Trump can declare a national emergency, can he then spend the funds to build the, uh, whatever you want to call it, wall or fortified fence uh, along portions of the southern border? Well, there are literally dozens and dozens of statutes adopted pursuant to the NEA that specify the powers a president may use after he's declared a national emergency. I want to look at two of them, and the first one is one that Mr. Perlman uh, uh, summarized to y'all uh, uh, a few minutes ago. It's 10 U.S. Code 2808, and the title of that provision is Construction Authority in the Event of a Declaration of War or National Emergency. Uh, it was uh, uh, read in pertinent part by uh, Mr. Perlman already, so I'll save myself a minute of my 15 minutes by not rereading uh, that paragraph to you. Uh, uh, let, me, let me point out um, a couple of potential uh, linguistic, perhaps legal problems that the president might confront with if he, if he invokes Section 2808 to uh, legitimize the uh, construction, the financing of the uh, border fence. First, Section 2808 only applies if the national emergency, quote, requires the use of the armed forces. Second, the funds, uh, if, uh, if indeed it's a case authorized by 2808, the funds may only be used to accomplish military construction projects that are, quote, necessary to support the use of the armed forces. Now, President Trump has already sent troops to the border. And when he's challenged in court, as he will be, as he has already been, the suits have been filed, he will eventually assert that the emergency requires the deployment of troops to our border. Protecting against foreign invasion is obviously uh, a duty of the President of the United States. And though a federal judge who dislikes uh, President Trump might intervene to say that troops are not required, I think the deference to the Commander-in-Chief on this is appropriate. It seems uh, difficult for me to accept that a non-elected judge would decide when the use of troops is uh, necessary and when it's not necessary. A border wall, but uh, what about the second limitation, that uh, the funds can only be used for projects that are necessary to support the use of the armed forces? A border wall might be seen, I suppose, as a military fortification. Is a wall necessary to support the use of troops? Well, the wall of a fort, for example, would be necessary, would I think be deemed as necessary to protect the inhabitants of the fort, but what about this fence uh, on the southern border? Will a, a court that dislikes uh, the president perhaps say that even with deference to the chief executive, it is impossible to conclude that the fence is necessary to help the armed forces do its job uh, at the southern border? Uh, that's a linguistic possibility. And in fact, I think given the performance of certain district judges in the past, maybe it's a probability, but it's not obvious to me that it's something that I would do if I were a federal judge. I think grant that deference. There's a third problem that is uh, less often noted. Um, as Mr. Perlman indicated, um, uh, 2808 allows for military construction. And according to 10 U.S. Code 2801, the term military construction in any provision of U.S. law includes any construction carried out with respect to a military installation. Okay, that's another term now of our military installation. Further down in Section 10, U.S. Code 2801, it's indicated that the term military installation means a base, camp, post, station, yard, center, or any other activity under the jurisdiction of the Secretary of the Military Department or the Secretary of Defense. Sorry for all that verbiage, but the point that I wanted to get across is I think that the border is under the jurisdiction of the Department of Homeland Security and not under the jurisdiction of the Department of Defense. Um, in that case, the administration is going to have to do a little bit of juggling. They're going to have to somehow place the fence uh, under the jurisdiction of the Department of Defense and not under the Department of Homeland Security. 
Okay, so much for 10 U.S. Code 2808, which is one of the two main authorizations, in my opinion, uh, for the construction of the wall by the President. Uh, the second is 33 U.S. Code 2293. 33 U.S. Code 2293. Now, if you go and look that up, you'll find that it's in, that it's in the chapter of the U.S. Code entitled, entitled Navigation and Navigable Waters. Now, you might say the border fence has very little to do with navigation and navigable waters, even though part of it is along a ditch called the Rio Grande River. Um, however, Section 2293 is entitled Reprogramming During National Emergencies, and it says, in the event of a declaration of national emergency um, that requires or may require use of the armed forces, the Secretary, without regard to any other provision of law, may apply the resources of the Department of the Army Civil Works Program to construct or assist in the construction, operation, maintenance, and repair of civil works and civil defense projects essential to the national defense. Note, 2293 applies if the emergency requires or may require the use of the armed forces, unlike 2808, which authorized the President to act only if the use of the armed forces was required. This is now required or may require. Uh, this is much more liberal than 2808. Uh, an invasion by millions of aliens might require the use of the armed forces one day. Um, true, only civil works essential to the national defense can be built under Section 2293, uh, but it's hard for me to conceive, again, that a non-elected judge will second-guess the president about uh, which uh, uh, civil works are necessary, essential, sorry, to the, uh, uh, to the national defense. Finally, President Trump has indicated that a little bit more than $6 billion is currently available from the Treasury Department's forfeiture fund and the Department of Defense's drug interdiction program to respond to the national emergency. Those funds, by statute, can be used to construct, and I quote, roads and fences and installations of lighting to block drug smuggling corridors. So I think the fence, uh, in fact, it's interesting that President Trump has started to call it more a fence and a little bit less off on the wall. Uh, the fence may qualify as um, uh, a road or fence and installation of lighting to block drug smuggling corridors. And the Treasury forfeiture funds, according to the statute, quote, shall be available for obligation or expenditure in connection with the law enforcement activities of any federal agency. As an aside, I saw with interest that Senator Cruz has proposed legislation to confiscate the alleged $14 billion um, in wealth of El Chapo, who has recently, as many of you all know, been convicted of murder and many other uh, violations. And that in and of itself would be enough to build the um, in, in, uh, entire wall. That would require special legislation, which apparently is pending before the, uh, uh, se the Senate. Uh, and it's not clear that uh, El Chapo's wealth is readily available to us, that we know where it is, that we know where to find it, that we know how to confiscate it, etc. In closing, let me just say, um, I think that this week the House and Senate will reverse the President's national emergency declaration, as is their right under the NEA. Uh, President Trump, of course, has the right to veto that reversal. He has not yet used his veto at all as a president, uh, uh, unlike previous presidents, but I think he will like, I don't know, of course, I'm not in the circles of power, but I think he will likely use it to veto this reversal, and I don't think the House or Senate have the supermajorities needed to override his veto of the reversals. Uh, the, na there, the national security fact deference that courts grant to the Commander-in-Chief has not stopped lower courts from second-guessing President Trump's travel ban, for example, and his steel tariffs. Uh, those reversal, those uh, 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 obstacles erected by lower courts uh, were ultimately removed by, upper, by higher courts, but it took lots of time to do so. There's plenty of wiggle room here, as I indicated, interpretively for federal judges who dislike the president to delay things with an injunction. So yes, I do think the wall will be held up to a form of what, what I could call lawfare, uh, but I don't think it should be under current law. Thanks, and again, it's a pleasure to be here. From El Dinero del Chapo uh, to Mr. Shapiro.
was that just because my name has an O at the end of it? Is that, was that the no. segue there? No. Okay. It's rhyming El Chapo in I Spanish for Yeah. Right. All right. All right. Sorry, he was up late with a with a sick child. So uh, um, uh, thanks to uh, the Federal Society, for whom I do a lot of events. But thanks, uh, it gives me pleasure to be able to thank the, the National Security uh, Institute here at uh, at Scalia Law. My law school classmate Jamil Jaffer uh, founded and, and heads it heads it up. I'm not sure if he's aware that uh, they're hosting me. Whether he would have countermanded that. Uh, uh, Situation, but but anyway, I'm I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, I agree with uh, much of what um, Professor Krauss has said. Um, I think there some of these very technical statutory authorities that Professor Krauss invoked. I'll go into that a little bit, but I think there are very colorful claims on both sides. It's not a slam dunk that it's clearly beyond or within uh, the the statutory purvey. Um, but regardless, my um, larger point is, even if uh, the president's actions or the wall construction pursuant to national emergency is uh, legal, uh, on, that meaning satisfies the four corners of these very broad statutes, uh, if that's the case, then that raises serious separation of powers, non-delegation, constitutional issues. And so, when I was first thinking about how to comment, uh, you know, what my uh, line would be, um, as is a lot of people's want these days, I was testing things out on Twitter. And what I came up with, and you can go, you won't find this tweet anymore because this is good practice, CLE tip for any lawyers out there. I have my Twitter set to delete seven days after I tweet, so there's no incriminating evidence and, and what have you. Uh, but what, what I tried out, and this I think is, uh, Lots of people came to this independently. I'm not some you know, genius for thinking of this, but legal but unconstitutional, or even if legal, unconstitutional. Mike Lee took a similar tack. And now this is a little cute, right? It's, if something is unconstitutional, it is illegal. The Constitution is our foundational law. So it's not that, oh, it's legal but unconstitutional. What does that mean? No, it, it, ultimately that means illegal. Uh, but it's the point that I just said. OK, um, let me back up. Our Constitution divides federal powers among three branches, right? Civics 101. I had to teach this to myself because, of course, I went to, I grew up in Canada. But three branches of government. I didn't, I didn't have Schoolhouse Rock on the TV and everything, but legislative, executive, and judicial. And one of the powers given exclusively to the legislative branch, to Congress, uh, is to spend money or to appropriate money for the executive branch to spend in enforcing the law, which is indeed the president's uh, duty to... Uh, to, to enforce the law. <coughs> Specifically, Article 1, Section 9, which is known as the Appropriations Clause, says that no money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law. Uh, and of course, uh, the purposes for which Congress can exercise this power of the purse are enumerated in Article 1, Section 8, which is why we have uh, legal battles over, for example, whether some federal law fits into a regulation of interstate commerce. Uh, so the idea that the executive branch can't exercise legislative power, this kind of very basic separation of powers principle, uh, includes the idea that it can't spend money that hasn't been appropriated, in addition to not being able to create new programs. Um, and congressional refusals to appropriate money uh, or create those federal programs do not uh, give the president more power, even if he thinks that it's really, really important to do something. That's what got uh, President Obama in trouble. Uh, DACA and DAPA, for example, which I generally support as a matter of policy, are new programs that create new immigration statuses. And so these executive actions have no constitutional basis, no matter what kind of pen or phone uh, was used or Twitter feed was used to uh, enact them. Uh, and so a presidential failure to get the deal he wants from Congress on a major policy priority Sound familiar? There are parallels with each president. That doesn't trigger new executive powers. But you know what does trigger executive powers? A national emergency. Various presidents have done things through emergency actions. This did not start with the NEA in 1976. It's like we had no emergencies before 1976. Uh, whatever you think of President Carter, right? Uh, <laughs> president Lincoln during the Civil War. That was, that was some heady stuff. And back then, physically, Congress could not get back to act on certain things. Um, uh, there were some emergencies. Officially, Woodrow Wilson declared the official, I am declaring an emergency, 
uh, relating not to World War I, relating to trade, economic sanctions, maritime regulations. In fact, most of more emergencies over the course of American history, including post-NEA, uh, involve some kind of trade restrictions. I'm, frankly, I'm surprised Donald Trump hasn't declared more emergencies to impose tariffs and whatever else. But regardless, um, you know, Woodrow Wilson started uh, with that, and there's really no, nothing in the Constitution that tells us uh, what the president can do in an emergency. Um, and most famously, uh, as Professor Krauss noted, uh, Justice Jackson's opinion in the Youngstown Steel case, the 1952 steel seizures, President Truman was rebuked uh, during the Korean War, right? Sounds pretty important, pretty emergent um, from stealing, uh, from seizing the, the steel mills. Uh, but anyway, until the Watergate era, when Congress decided, well, we don't really trust the presidency all that much, so let's try to restrict and regulate it in some way, and that's what happened with the NEA. The National Emergencies Act didn't give the president emergency powers. It actually tried to put a, you know, cabin them in some way, regulate them in some way. Although it did it in a kind of a poor way. First, because it didn't define what an emergency is, and I agree with Professor Krauss that we can argue about whether what's going on at the southern border really is or is not an emergency. Um, you know, and you know, kind of the, the common English definition of emergency is something that happens suddenly that requires immediate action, that's urgent. Uh, it's not, you know, a big problem uh, or you know, a significant issue that should require government action. You know, those are different than what an emergency is. I just looked up just now in Merriam-Webster. I'm sure if you pick other dictionaries, there'll be something similar. Uh, first, an unforeseen combination of circumstances or the resulting state that calls for immediate action. Or two, an urgent need for assistance or relief. I don't know. Beats me. No court is going to enforce that. I mean, there's no. Certainly, the Supreme Court. John Roberts is not going to start enforcing uh, the, the 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 jot and tittle of a text that does not exist in the actual statute. So we can debate whether there's a real emergency. There's actually a larger problem with, as Professor Krauss was saying, uh, large numbers of families and people with children showing up. That has not happened uh, in recent times. It used to be unaccompanied men, you know, uh, all of these, uh, the, the, the kind of the, the, the shifts at the border of what we're facing, the issues are different than what they were even five years ago. Uh, but regardless, uh, what the NEA does do uh, and if we're not going to litigate the emergency, I mean, you know, there could be some district judges, as Professor Krauss said, uh, that will find that as a matter of law, there's no emergency. I don't think that'll ultimately uh, uh, hold up um, because of this disability, just, just disability concerns. But what the NEA does is to say, uh huh, when there's an emergency, however you define it, um, first, it triggers certain powers as have to be specified in various statutes. The Brennan Center report did very well and. Uh, listing a lot of them. I think there's even more. I think there's hundreds. It's not just dozens, but hundreds of, of statutes that can be triggered by different kinds of emergency declarations. And secondly, Congress tried to restrict this power by allowing for a legislative veto. That is, if a majority of Congress votes against, it's terminated. Now, the problem with that is that uh, INS v. Chadha, a 1983 case, struck down a legislative veto. There, it's a one house legislative veto, but uh, the same applies to, to both houses, and so we're just in a normal situation of uh, you need a supermajority uh, to overcome a, a presidential veto. Um, but again, uh, what are these emergency powers that are unlocked uh, that, are, uh, uh, that are triggered? Um, very broad things. Uh, as Professor Krauss, again, you know, I'm sort of agree agreeing and expanding upon his remark, because this, this is important. Uh, since the NEA, presidents have declared now, including the wall emergency, 59 emergencies, 32 of which now are still in play. Um, I mean, did you know, for example, that we are still living under uh, President Carter's national emergency responding to the Iran hostage taking in 1979, still under that state of emergency? Uh, or did you know that uh, when in 2006 George W. Bush declared a national emergency with respect to blocking property of certain persons undermining democratic processes or institutions in Belarus. That is still an ongoing emergency 13 years later. The, the fraud in the Belarusian presidential elections still. And I mean, clearly there's a problem with, you know, pre-Trump, pre-Trump and Obama. I mean, this is just a thing that Congress has not fixed properly. Uh, so again, I, I have a hard time saying that, well, uh, you know, courts will say this is not an emergency, that's why this is illegal. So now we get to the statutory analysis. 
And the funny thing here is, I believe the terms of our debate resolution is, can Trump, I'm paraphrasing, can Trump build the wall according to the emergency declaration? Well, we're not even going to actually get to that question for quite some time, because about half, or maybe a little more than half, of the money that he plans to use uh, isn't triggered by the emergency. Uh, for example, the $1.6 billion that Congress actually did agree to in the latest DHS budget, right? The, the thing that triggered the, the shutdown, then its government started up again, and then they finally agreed to the deal. There's $1.6 billion there. That takes a while to spend, right? Then there's the Treasury Forfeiture Fund, uh, about $600 million there. Uh, and all that says is that you can use these uh, assets that have been seized pursuant to civil asset forfeiture. We, you know, cabin the debate over whether that's a good policy or not. But anyway, there's $600 million in this Treasury Department fund for law enforcement activity to support, ultimately, law enforcement activities of any federal agency. Now, you could argue there are some kind of sub-clauses there that might, but anyway, that is uh, uh, not subject to, or not triggered by the irrelevant, by the emergency. Then there are about $2.5 billion uh, under the Department of Defense for supporting counter-drug activities. Uh, specifically construction of roads and fences and installation of lighting to block drug smuggling corridors. Um, you know, is the wall, does that fit into that? I don't know. There will be litigation. There is litigation already over that, but that's not related to the emergency. Okay? So when we're actually talking about, you know, the, can you do it under the emergency, this is the $3.6 billion uh, from the Department of Defense military construction projects. Uh, Professor Krauss quoted this. I want to put a finer point on it. In the event of a declaration by the president of a national emergency in accordance with the NEA that requires use of the armed forces, does it require the use of the armed forces to build a wall or to defend the southern border in the, at this time, pursuant to this emergency? I don't know. That'll be litigated again. That's that statutory provision. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, Secretary of Defense may authorize certain things to, under, to undertake military construction projects not otherwise authorized that are necessary to support such use of the armed forces. So to this date, you've heard about National Guardsmen being called up and what have you to the border. Um, they've been called up to support uh, Border Patrol, DHS, other law enforcement. So it's not, you know, it's kind of backwards. Nobody's supporting the armed forces. They're uh, uh, providing logistical support. For, will that change with the wall construction? I don't know. Again, these are kind of uh, uh, legalistic uh, uh, debates that, that certainly will happen. I, I think it's as likely as not, at least, uh, that it doesn't satisfy the, this statutory parameter. But again, remember, we went through, you have to blow through about over $3 billion of funding from these non-emergency funds before you even get to those emergency funds. It's not clear whether if Trump is not re-elected, whether we get even to that. Which means, will anyone even have standing to sue? So, you know, this is—it's great to debate in the abstract, but just to just to be clear, for you know, for educational purposes, uh, it's not clear that anyone has standing yet to challenge uh, the emergency or the use of the funds um, uh, that are triggered uh, by the emergency declaration. Uh, so, you know, lawyers will argue about whether may require, will require, you know, national security supporting the armed forces, uh, all of that thing. But even if this uh, wall construction satisfies the legal niceties, which is a big, as I said, but not improbable if, there's something odd and, and wrong, really, about what's going on. Because it looks a lot like the executive branch engaging in legislative action, meaning legislative appropriation or reappropriation. Uh, so even if the declaration or the use of the funds for the wall pursuant to it is technically legal under existing law, then that law itself, specifically that defense construction authorization of the president to move funds around, that itself uh, looks to be constitutionally problematic as a matter of whether you call it separation of powers, non-delegation, right? All of these uh, uh, left-wingers all of a sudden are, are raising this point as well. I mean, it's great. You know, reviving the non-delegation doctrine to own the cons. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> the, the odd bedfellows here, right? Um, so, you know, Chief Justice Roberts could, if this ever gets to the Supreme Court, do a lot with this in the name of constitutional avoidance, right? He'd rather not have broad, sweeping constitutional uh, rulings, and therefore he might decide that the wall is not legal for purposes of the statute, so he doesn't have to get to the constitutional issue. I don't know. This is kind of gaming out the legal realism, uh, what have you. 
Uh, but you know, even if John Roberts thinks the wall can be justified under, say, the taxing power, uh, well, that power also is properly belonging to uh, Congress. And even worse, uh, this action does set a terrible precedent for future administrations whose policy goals may be radically different. Now, not all of the parades of horribles that have been mentioned in that context uh, are real, because again, you know, whether you talk about the Green New Deal or Medicare for All or confiscating all the guns, there actually does have to be a statutory trigger. It's not you declare an emergency and then you get to do whatever. If there's an actual statute that would allow uh, these you know, nightmare scenarios, uh, then, then that's one thing. But it does. There, I think there are plenty of uh, nightmare scenarios that, that, are, uh, that would be triggered by a president just being able to declare an emergency uh, willy-nilly. So at the end of the day, uh, I support on constitutional grounds, uh, regardless of what the policy merits are, or even the statutory analysis, uh, the rejection of the, uh, of the presidential emergency. I'll leave it there. Do you care to rebut? I'll just or, give me 30 or seconds. Or uh, it won't take more than that. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we disagree on a heck of a lot. Uh, frankly, uh, I, just, uh, I don't think we disagree on a heck of a lot. I'll just say that I think many of Ilya's arguments are policy arguments, and it's not clear to me that, it's, that, that the president's invocation of the national emergency was a good thing uh, for many of the same reasons. I certainly think it opens a Pandora's box. Uh, but that's not the question that we are here to address. The, uh, whether it was opportune or not is not the question. The que and I think that um, when Congress says to a president, if you declare an emergency, you can take funds we've given you to do X, and you can use them to do a close cousin of X, um, it's not obvious to me that that's unconstitutional. Um, and I think that's what the NEA did, essentially. The NEA and the subsequent uh, ruling the statutes uh, pursuant to NEA, and, and the, uh, the question is going to be whether the very narrow uh, statutory interpretation issues uh, 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 should lead to deference to the president's choices. Is this likely to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, be needed to help the military do its job under the second statutory provision that I cited? My own view is that a judge should be very deferential about that. Uh, but judges tend not to be deferential to President Trump, and uh, that's something that doesn't have anything to do with the rule of law, but just with politics, I think. I think the level of deference will turn on whether the particular judge thinks that this is a matter of national security or a matter of domestic spending enforcement. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. We'll, uh, we've got time for a couple of questions. I'm going to fire off one. Uh, you know, to Professor Krauss, uh, you know, we're Everybody's watching the Senate more or less, but knowing that it's a foregone conclusion that the Senate will probably vote with the House in terms of uh, their declaration of, uh, you know, disagree. I believe it's a joint resolution expressing disagreement. Uh, for those of you that want to know, it's Section uh, 1622A1 is what provides uh, Congress the ability to uh, override, uh, so to speak, uh, the, the declaration. Um, but notwithstanding INS v. Chata, which Ilya raised, um, even if there's no veto-proof majority in both houses, you still have a statement by both houses. What does that do to your young step analysis? Um, I think that only does something to the young to the Youngstown analysis if you disagree with Chata. Personally, I don't think Chata should have come down the way that it did come down. But it is the I mean, there's, there's a jurisprudential issue behind a lot of what's going on in this, uh, in this debate. Um, are we looking at a constitution, an ideal constitution, as we think it should have been interpreted over the years? Uh, if we are, then I think Ilya and I probably agree on a heck of a lot of things that would be contrary to current uh, constitutional practice. I think what we've got, though, is decades of constitutional practice, of lack of challenge, of presidential emergency declarations. We've got the Chata decision, which is, uh, I, I don't see any uh, likelihood of it being overturned on the horizon. And uh, I think it's to disrespect Chata uh, to say that um, um, Youngstown, uh, uh, the, the, that the third part of the trichotomy of Youngstown, the part that says, when Congress disapproves of the president, his authority is at its weakest uh, level. I think that it's to disrespect Chada to say that the third part of the trichotomy applies now. But to the contrary, I think Chada means 
ah, Congress passed a statute that says that the two chambers can disapprove of an emergency declaration, but the president can veto, and then we will see whether Congress has the supermajority required. And if Congress has the supermajority required to overturn, then Congress has overturned the president's uh, veto. So it's really the Chada decision is sort of coming back exactly as Ilya uh, said. So I think that that's not, I don't, I don't think you can, you can square that circle given the Chada case. I'm actually not sure that Youngstown is too relevant here because that case was of course under the presidential inherent powers and here we have the National Emergency yes. Act. So you know, there might be a related inquiry as to that deference question that we've been talking about. Uh, do you defer to the, to the executive's uh, interpretation of what requires armed forces or what constitutes offense, stuff like that? Maybe that there, you, the, the, you know, how much you defer, uh, the question of whether Congress agrees uh, might, might play in. For that matter, you know, Chevron deference might play in, uh, what your views of that are. But those are those are secondary questions. So this is not like Youngstown Steel, which of course was in, a, in the pre-NEA world. Um, as for the role of DOD, you both hinted at uh, in, in slightly different ways uh, the role of the Defense Department, and the Armed Forces, relative to other agencies, uh, specifically DHS. Um, you know, without mentioning it, uh, there's uh, you know, reference to Posse Comitatus Act, the, the Department of Defense, the Armed Forces are not allowed to act as a primary, in a law enforcement capacity uh, within the borders of the United States, but they are permitted to support other agencies. Um, and so we have a, a question, I, I guess, in terms of statutory interpretation of uh, what comes first uh, in, in uh, terms of uh, who's supporting whom, and uh, Professor Krauss phrased it in terms of uh, jurisdiction at the border, um, and uh, Ilya phrased it in terms of nobody supporting the armed forces. The arm, you know, the armed forces are supporting other agencies. Um, but uh, for for each of you, does DOD's involvement or support of DHS trigger what uh, I suppose? To use government terminology, might be considered jurisdictional equities that are legally cognizable. Do you want to go first? I mean, if there was an, an armed force of some kind on the border, that would be different than, you know, if, if there's a humanitarian crisis, for example, which I would say this is closer to than a, than a military invasion. Um, does that require the use of the armed forces? I mean, it might be nice. It's, it sort of parallels the discussions about the necessary and proper clause. I mean, it might be nice to use the military in certain ways. They might have certain capabilities or just bodies to help out with the effort. But are they required? I don't think so. Uh, does it, does it uh, enhance the, the fact that these guardsmen over the last couple of years were called up, and they were called up under Obama as well, by the way. Uh, does that strengthen the government's position? that this is under DOD jurisdiction, or however you want to phrase it. I don't know. That's kind of like creating your own, you know, changing the terms of the law just by having this uh, you know, discretionary uh, enforcement act. I'm not sure you can do that. Um, well, I'll just say that a large part of what law is, the way that law works in every society, is to observe practice, to see when the practice is challenged, if it's not challenged, and it becomes a, an accepted practice, then, then it acquires some uh, legitimacy. I don't think that if an alien comes across the border illegally and commits a murder, that the army may uh, uh, hunt down this alien. Uh, that's a police power, and that's not for the uh, military to do, but I think the military can stand at the border and prevent people who have no right from coming in from uh, coming in. And if they can stand at the border, they can presumably uh, use technical means to facilitate the, this, which would be a fence, for example. So um, I, I, I think that the federal government uh, has, has, has used, uh, um, you know, my goodness, we have nationalized the, the, the state national guard uh, for domestic purposes for many, many uh, for purposes socially, morally legitimate purposes over the last 50 years. This one 
it seems to me, is morally legitimate, whether or not we think that it's an opportune uh, use of the armed forces. It also depends on your definition of require, because, you know, may require, fine. You know, we can argue about that. There's plenty of leeway. Yeah. Judge probably not going to rule against it on, on that ground. But that requires the use of the armed forces. Does that mean necessitates, or does that mean, you know, an action that uses the armed forces? It requires almost superfluous in that kind of linguistic construction. Uh, it could be. You could, you could argue that, that, that it is. Um, and this is why, ultimately, like I said, these are, these are close questions, and uh, uh, it's very plausible that it you know, is within the four corners of, uh, of even that statute. Uh, but you know, I have these broader it, constitutions. Is, is that a justiciable question? Well, it's justiciable, and then the judge you know, either defers or, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's a statutory interpretation question, absolutely. That's different than whether, it, whether it's an emergency. I agree that that may not be justiciable. Sir, are we hard capped at one? Uh, no, we do. Uh, if, if any of you have uh, questions and want to be a first victim. I have a question. You mentioned the Senator Cruz bill um, mm -hmm. to basically use asset forfeiture for uh, jobless funds. Yeah. But um, given that like Austin and Tins have held that asset forfeiture is a penalty, a criminal penalty, um, would that violate Article 1, Section 9, um, ex post facto? So my own understanding is, and I'm not an expert in this area, but my understanding is his assets can already be forfeit under existing law. Or are going to be regardless. Right. The question is what, how can those forfeited assets be used? And the Cruz bill is only saying these assets, if they can already be forfeited uh, because of his criminal act, because they were the fruits of his criminal activity, once they're forfeited, we're going to use those <laughs> assets to build the fence, which by the way, I can't resist uh, saying that this would allow President Trump to proclaim to the world that we did get Mexico to pay for the wall, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and I think everybody else would say, well, no, <laughs> his market was mostly American. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, the NEA was written in a broad ill-defined way, largely because not every emergency is created equal. Do you think there are effective reforms, though, in spite of that, that could uh, limit the NEA, but uh, would not, I guess, uh, hurt in a real emergency? So I would actually put in a definition of emergency, even if it still remains non-justiciable, just because words matter, and you know, at the margins, that can't hurt. Uh, but I think even more importantly would be to put in a sunset clause rather than legislative veto just to say that, you know, in the age of modern communications, modern travel, this is not civil war days, this is not, you know, calling Congress back into session takes however long. There are very few times when the legislature can act. So give them 30 days or 60 days, something like that. And um, if Congress doesn't, you know, uh, uh, extend it or, or pass some sort of legislation putting legislating or appropriating, then, uh, then it expires. I don't disagree with that. I'll just add that, um, as the Brennan Center indicates, there are, do and as Ilya has indicated, there are dozens of these emergency declarations that are still in effect. You and I cannot do business with a whole bunch of people because the president said so based on um, a flood in Haiti or based on uh, corruption in Belarus. Uh, not because he was statutorily authorized to do so, but he was statutorily authorized to declare an emergency. So the only thing that troubles me is if we change the NEA, I, so I'm not necessarily opposed to changing the NEA, but if we change the NEA just because it's Trump who used it, then that's, that's always what I fear, is that this, this no longer becomes um, a question relevant to the rule of law, but just a, a political matter about opposition to one person. I, I would add, you know, it, there, there is a lot of talk on the Hill about uh, adding a sunset clause. Um, there's a serious question about whether in cases like this that that would make a material difference. Now, Ilya mentioned it takes a lot of time to spend this much money. As somebody who was in government a long time, <coughs> I could debate that, but, um, uh, but, but nevertheless, um, you know, the Section 2808 in particular allows the president to play with military construction funds that, as I said 
earlier have been appropriated but not obligated. Now, obligation is a term of art in fiscal law that is very important because, as I said, it, it triggers a legal liability to pay. So you've signed the contracts or, or services have been provided or whatnot, um, you know, awarding the contract, placing an order, for example. And what makes military construction funds different from any other funds that, the federal, that Congress appropriates is that most appropriations, as you know from the shutdown, are based on annual appropriation cycle. Some are based on a two-year cycle. State, a lot of State Department funds and certain other ones. MILCON appropriations are five-year funds. So say you enact an NEA provision with a you know, six-month sunset clause, a year sunset clause. If the administration has obligated, otherwise non-obligated funds that are military construction funds, those funds still have a lifespan of five years. So as a policy matter, there's a question about whether that has practical effect in this circumstance. Well, on that sunny note, we're about five after one, and uh, I, I don't know when your finals are, but good luck studying. <laughs> um, good luck on the midterm. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I, I hope you found it engaging.